Black Lives Matter. Stop the violence. Hands up, don't shoot. But what about black on black crime? No justice, no peace. Back the blue. We got a lot of slogans, a lot of talking, a lot of history about a topic that has confused and confounded this country long before this country was even a country. And that topic is violence, more specifically, violence against the black body. Now, I feel like I'm qualified to speak about violence against the black body. Uh, not only am I a sociologist who teaches about the intersection of race, crime, and punishment, but, and despite what I tell my kids about my age, they think I'm 26, <laughs> I have a solid four decades of experience living, breathing, crying, hurting, and thinking about black bodies. Right? So yes, if I, could, if I wanted to, I could stand up here and recite the number of statistics about the disturbing and seemingly endemic crime that exists in many black communities. I could also talk about the over $3 billion that police departments have paid out in the last decades due to misconduct and brutality complaints. The good news for you all is that I'm not gonna do that. I'm off the clock, all right? Besides, bless you. You're welcome. This is something that's more personal, right? When I was 11 years old, I made a split second decision to walk to the store with my big brother. Uh, he was five years older than me, and he had a real job, so I figured if I played my cards right, I could, I could finagle some, some candy, maybe a pop, or my favorite, Cool Ranch Doritos, right? We didn't live in the worst neighborhood, but it wasn't the greatest but I felt comfortable walking to the store, and to my surprise, about 10 minutes later, I had a gun in my face. Okay. On our way home from the store, uh, some man saw us and thought we were easy prey. He stopped us, he put out a gun, and he told us to empty our pockets. Our house was like two houses away. I could see my bedroom, my bedroom window. I wanted to call out for my dad, but I was frozen in fear. Nothing came out. My older brother didn't fare much better. Now, this is the 90s, so we got weapons back then. So I'd seen him cry before, but I'd never seen him this afraid before. To his credit, his fear did not stop him from putting his black body in front of mine. What amounted to a little more than $20 and my bag of Cool Ranch Doritos. He really took the Doritos. This man, he shattered my innocence, and then he woke me up to the reality of violence against the black body. This man was black himself. Fast forward two years, and now I'm 13. A little bit of facial hair, he couldn't tell me anything. Okay? Uh, my two other brothers and my cousin Paul, we were catching the bus to football practice. We were relatively poor, so we moved around a lot. Um, and instead of switching teams, we just caught the bus. It was cheap. And my brother Leon, who was one year older than me, he had a cap gun. I haven't been in a cap gun market in a long time, but back in the 90s, they, they looked real. They were small, compact, but they had a bright orange tip. That orange tip was to alert any curious onlooker that this gun was a toy that is not real. Well, when we got on the bus, Leon dropped the gun. He picked it up, put it in his pocket, and we went to the back of the bus. It was me, Leon, Ricky, and my cousin Paul. We didn't think anything of it. Kids dropped their toys all the time. Didn't occur to us, as we sat there talking about football and video games and girls, that the bus didn't move. It stayed in the same spot. Two, five, maybe even 10 minutes, it's hard to say. We didn't know. Ricky, who was two years older than me, right when he began to realize something was off, we were all startled by a loud and what seemed like an angry voice. Freeze. Hands where I can see him. Don't fucking move. Don't fucking move. Forgive me, I don't mean to be brash. I'll never forget those words. I'll never forget turning to the right and seeing two cops Guns drawn, pointed directly at us. 
Before we could even comprehend what was happening, two more cop cars pulled up. And through a haze of fear and panic and flashing lights, I, once again, had a gun pointed at my face. Apparently, when Leon dropped his gun, the bus driver didn't know it was fake. She thought it was real, and she secretly caught the cops. And all they knew, what they thought they knew, was that there were four boys, four black boys, in the back of the bus, and one of them had a gun. Okay? We didn't go to practice that day. Suddenly, football, video games, girls, just didn't seem all that important. Okay? As time went on, my fear, my sadness, turned to anger. It turned to confusion. Why did this happen? In a 24-month span, on two separate occasions, I had a deadly weapon pointed at my face. In a 24-month span, on two separate occasions, I saw people that I loved most in the world fear for their life. In a 24-month span, on two separate occasions, my parents could have lost one, two, three, or all of their sons. Why? Why is this okay? Why is this normal? Now, as an adult, when I want to make sense of these kinds of issues, I do what I do best. I turn to sociology. And in this case, right, I want to turn to the great African-American sociologist, W.E.B. Du Bois. Right? This is a man who was ahead of his time. He was shunned in his time. Okay. But, luckily, with the benefit of history, we see him for what he was, a great sociologist, a great social scientist. Okay. Du Bois posited that black people in America, Negroes, as he called them back then, had a double consciousness. Okay. That there was a certain two-ness to being a black person and an American. That to strive for success or even acceptance in a country that despises you, took a certain kind of strength, a certain kind of mental fortitude. Du Bois wrote, it is a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks on in amused contempt. One ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two worn ideals, and one dark body, whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. We were kids. I was a kid. My brothers were kids. My cousin Paul was a kid. That's me. That's Red. That's Ricky. That's Leon. Hey, right? Mr. Capgun right here. Okay. And again, in 24 months, we all, just doing what kids do, had guns pointed in our faces. Okay. So, looking back on our collective experiences, I realized that that two-ness that the boy spoke of is still real. It's not just real, it's real within me. I have my own double consciousness. I struggle with it. I try to make sense of it. It haunts me, it dominates my thoughts, it shapes how I view the world, it shapes how I view my place in the world. Okay. So here it is. Here is my double consciousness. I am conscious of the fact that in many black communities across the country, violence, especially gun violence and gang violence, is a huge problem. It is sucking the lifeblood out of neighborhoods, it is destroying families. Okay? It is crushing people's souls. Okay? Headlines, 500 homicides, 400 homicides, 200 homicides are so commonplace now that most folks can see it and keep scrolling. But those were people. Many of those people are going to be black. And the person who killed many of those people will also be black. I am conscious of that fact. I am also conscious of the fact that these very communities, these ghettos, were created by the state. They're not organic. They didn't just appear out of thin air. 
They have been pillaged and plundered for several centuries. Okay? For millions of black parents, they're going to wake up in neighborhoods and send their kids to segregated schools. Their neighborhoods are going to be policed as if they're occupied territory. And the rest of us will pat ourselves on the back about how, how much progress we've made, how good we're doing, how egalitarian we are. I am conscious of that fact. I am conscious of the fact that for too many black boys, they are taught, they learn, they believe that the best way to show their manhood, their masculinity, is through domination, through the subjugation of women, through violence against other black boys. Okay? I am also conscious of the fact that a lot of black boys don't get the chance to be black boys. Okay? They're not seen as children. They're seen as men. So Tamir Rice, who was shot and killed by a cop in Ohio, he was not a 12-year-old boy playing with a toy gun in the park. He was a man. He was hulking. He was menacing. He was a threat that needed to be neutralized. And he was. I am conscious of that fact. If we truly want to get to a place where freedom dreaming is more than just a theme, we have to start with honesty. Okay? We have to explore our consciousness, sometimes our double consciousness. If we want society to truly be a place of liberty and opportunity and freedom and equality, then we have to do the work. We have to put those values into action. They need to be deeds. They must shape our lives in practice, not just in theory. I wish I could stand here and tell you that everything's going to be okay. Right? I wish I could stand here and tell you that the arc of the universe truly does bend towards justice. But I'm a sociologist. I need some evidence. Right? I am willing to do the work. In fact, I have to do the work. I owe it to an 11-year-old boy to do the work. That 11-year-old boy, little Marcus, what they used to call me, Butchie and Pearl's youngest son. He stayed out of trouble. I got straight A's in school. I loved sports. I loved video games. I had a crush on a girl named Rebecca. Loved Cool Ranch Doritos. And on one day, that little boy decided to walk to the store with his big brother. And everything changed. The good news is that he was not torn asunder. He's still here. I'm still here. And I'm ready to do the work. Join me. Thank you. Go to the next slide.